In the discussion about the circumstances of the formation of Grand Lodge, the character and testimony of James Anderson have emerged as central. Ooh, there we go. Um, we have shown that there are serious grounds for doubting his account of the revival of Grand Lodge, but perhaps one of the most fascinating aspects of this research as it is developing has been the way in which Anderson is emerging as a much more complex and conflicted character than previous writing on him has suggested. One problem with Anderson is that too firm a distinction has frequently been drawn between his Masonic and non-Masonic activities. But it's impossible to understand the dis dis different aspects of his career in isolation. We have many sources with which to explore Anderson's career, including snippets of which are up there, um, the minute books of his Presbyterian chapel, a catalog of his remarkable library, um, the uh, release register of the Fleet Prison, um, and his religious writings. Um, these sources have not hitherto been used by Masonic scholars, and they deserve much more attention. They illustrate how Anderson's thought was deeply rooted in Scottish Calvinist traditions, and his Scottish education connected him with the early European Enlightenment, particularly in the Netherlands. We believe these contexts are essential for understanding the formation of the early Grand Lodge and interpreting Anderson's role in it. This may be the only image of Anderson, and I suspect he wouldn't like it any more than he's going to like what I'm having to say. Um, to illustrate this, I'd like to share with you some work that I have recently been doing on Anderson's revision of the first charge in the 1738 Constitutions. When David Hackett published That Religion in Which All Men Agree, Freemasonry in American Culture, in 2014, he chose a title echoing James Anderson's famous phrase from the Constitutions of the Freemasons. Hackett states, taking the latitudinarian view shared by moderate Anglican priests and Protestant dissenters, Anderson pledged the fraternity in a position midway between a parochial high church Anglicanism and an unbelieving natural religion. This analysis is typical, but is it accurate? And even if the early Grand Lodge did intend to endorse broad tolerance towards religion, was that also Anderson's intent? Returning to the primary sources left by Anderson argues for a more nuanced interpretation of what he meant by that phrase in his composition of the first charge of Freemasonry. My goodness. Um, I don't need it. It's all right. To understand the intellectual background Anderson brought to the task, we must set aside preconceived notions of late 17th century Scotland as an isolated backwater. Rather, as Esther Myers argues in her study of Scots students who went to the continent to finish their studies, the nation's far-flung mercantile outposts and intellectual contacts, especially with the Netherlands, gave Scotland an actively European vantage point, linking it closely to events and ideas on the continent. When scholars finished, they frequently came back to share the newest ideas and pedagogical techniques uh, at Scotland's own schools and universities, adapting the academically rigorous, religiously moderate, and scientifically forward-looking Dutch model to the political and confessional situation in Scotland. A key truth to consider here is that the Enlightenment was not a monolithic monument movement, but unfolded in distinct ways depending on national circumstances. Scholars did not leave Scotland solely or even mainly on account of the superiority of foreign schools, for the Scottish schools increasingly held their own academically. Rather, throughout Scotland's long reformation, the universities were beset by periodic waves of political and religious violence and persecution. In Aberdeen, the universities were purged five times, four between 1630 and 1716. Despite these challenges, returning scholars often found teaching positions, for from the 16th through the 18th century, Scotland boasted a higher proportion of universities to population than any country in Europe, with Anderson's hometown of Aberdeen hosting two of them, Kings and Marshall. Anderson earned an undergraduate degree termed a Master of Arts and completed graduate work in divinity at Marshall at a time when Paul Wood observes the university was infused with the most current trends in early enlightenment um, and continental education. 
Despite the traditional structure of the Marshall curriculum, based on Latin lectures of the trivium and quadrivium, regents and chairs of distinct subjects incorporated the new science into their lectures well before either Oxford or Cambridge. <laughs> In 1698, Anderson completed his undergraduate studies, and while there's no mention in the university record of him uh, studying as postgraduate, the bursary supporting him for divinity studies does appear in the Aberdeen Council records. The result of graduate study would normally have been licensure for preaching, such as this, um, licensure for preaching followed by ordination in Scotland. Instead, he went south to England. Thus, after eight years of university, Anderson completed what should be acknowledged at, was as rigorous and frankly forward-thinking a university education as could be obtained at that time anywhere in the British Isles. However, any hint of latitudinarianism was, in religion was quickly quashed. Contemporary Scottish universities were primarily institutions for breeding up rigorously orthodox Calvinist ministers. We should remember that Anderson's contemporary Edinburgh student Thomas Aikenhead was hanged in 1697 for blasphemy, a case that revealed the determination of the Scottish Kirk to rein in heterodox influences. This happened the same year that the last significant Scottish witch hunt centered in Paisley resulted in the death of seven condemned men and women. These actions came at a time when the General Assembly of the Church of Scotland was endeavoring yet again to assert uniformity throughout its presbyteries and synods. One important tool at its disposal was enforcement of subscription to the Westminster Confession of Faith. Any individual licensed to preach and all students seeking licensure, licensure were obliged to subscribe to the rigorously Calvinist confession, originally adopted by the Kirk in 1647. Accompanying subscription was a visitation of Scottish universities to purge heterodox professors and ensure enforcement. This was driven home for Anderson when he had a personal brush with an inquisitorial presbytery in 1697. He was only 19 when he was called as a witness in an investigation into irregularities in the behavior of a local minister who, amongst other offenses, allegedly boasted that, quote, the way to be a Presbyterian minister was to speak nonsense with authority, end quote. I was raised Presbyterian. I can tell you that's probably true. <laughs> Thus, when Anderson's London congregation called him for ordination, they expected and they received an erudite scholar who was also prepared to both own and defend the whole doctrine of the confession of faith. Given Anderson's intellectual background and training, it's no surprise that the two historical events with the greatest impact on his worldview were the 1685 revocation of the Edict of Nantes, which sent at least 200,000 Huguenots into exile, and the Glorious Revolution of 1688. This is worth no it is worth noting that both the revocation and the Glorious Revolution occurred within the context of what Paul Jenkins identifies as one of the most religiously repressive decades in European history, a time of intense violence and bigotry. William III's conquest of Britain was accompanied in Scotland by the seven ill years of famine, which were particularly severe in Ad Anderson's native Aberdeen. The hardships of the 1690s, coupled with the financial and political di disaster of the failed colonial Darien scheme, suggest why Anderson and his younger brother Adam, an economic historian, relocated to London for their professional lives. Both events also reinforced the bond between Scots Presbyterians and Continental Calvinists by bringing into sharper focus their common struggle against the spiritual and political threats of, Calvin of Catholicism. A third normative event was the creation of the United Kingdom in 1707. Rather than a creation, it was bitterly resented by many in Scotland as a destruction of their national identity and independence, contributing to a prolonged Jacobite unrest in the Northern Kingdom. For Anderson, this loss of ind Scottish independence nonetheless offered a distinct advantage. He migrated to London, where in 17, December 1707, just months after the official union, he was called as minister to the Scots Presbyterian Church in London and ordained. 
From this pulpit, Anderson engaged in a series of very public religious debates, most notably that of the nonconformist meeting at Salters Hall in 1719, at which he proclaimed his subscription to the doctrine of the Trinity, and also to advising other nonconformists to accept it as well. As a result of that debate, he earned a reputation as one of the most prominent religious controversialists in London, prompting a contemporary to observe that he has not that guard upon his conduct that serious Christians could wish, and convincing another that he was a spy for the Aberdeen Presbytery. His outspoken Presbyterian orthodoxy not only secured for him a position as chaplain to the Ninth Earl of Buchan, one of the Scottish lords in the new joint parliament, but also positioned him to serve as a representative of the Kirk and Aberdeen to the governments of George I and George II. Anderson remained at Swallow Street through January uh, 1735 when he was expelled by his congregation. By then, his flock had a number of reasons to tire of him, though theology does not seem to have been one of them. His replacement was another martial divine, bred up in the same educational system and reformed confession as Anderson. Anderson was also the primary author of the first and second editions of the Constitution of the Freemasons, published in 1723 and 1738. The strong connection between these two facets of his career, theological and Masonic, has often been remarked upon, but remains insufficiently explored. The purpose of this essay, then, is to demonstrate what can be discovered by turning to primary sources to address the question of what Anderson intended by the wording uh, he used in the first charge of Freemasonry, especially in the 1738 edition of the Constitution. This edition is of particular interest because it is a product of Anderson's mature theological beliefs and historical methods, and because the phrasing he uses for the first charge differs so markedly from that used in the 1723 edition, and indeed from subsequent editions of the Constitution. The evidence argues persuasively that Anderson and his publishers, Caesar Ward and Richard Chandler, undertook what became the 1738 edition uh, primarily for financial reasons. Chandler and Ward were ambitious to expand their business and had recently established bookshops in both Scarborough and York in addition to their base in London. All three were destined for financial disappointment. In the face of mounting debts, Chandler took his own life in 1744. The next year, Ward was forced into bankruptcy. Dealing just with Anderson for now, we must recognize that his finances were a perpetual challenge. London nonconformist ministers were poorly paid, their incomes dependent on what their congregants could donate. Reading the Sessions book for the Swallow Street Chapel reveals that by 1734, Anderson was on extremely poor terms with his congregation. Anticipating a rupture, he personally leased space for a new congregation adjacent to the Leicester House residence of the Prince of Wales. It was an expense he could ill afford, and the chapel failed to thrive. Worse, Anderson's concern about losing the Swallow Street pulpit was entirely justified and the March 1734 delivery of a new crown lease to the chapel in his name only was a surprise and a final straw for his congregation, who sought a new minister from Aberdeen, William Cruikshank, and ignominiously Anderson was obliged to perform Cruikshank's ordination in January 1735. Ejected from his pulpit, Anderson set about to find other sources of income. The minutes tell us that he presented a memorial to the Grand Lodge the month after installing his ministerial successor, lodging complaints about William Smith's piracy of text from the first constitutions for his own pocket companion. Anderson requested authorization to publish a second edition of the constitutions with exclusive Grand Lodge approval. He soon had ample time to devote to the task, imprisoned as an insolvent debtor in London's free prison from late December 1735 until his death in 1739. The nature of his debt is unclear, though contemporaries cited both the expense of his large personal library and his involvement in a tapestry weaving bubble. Prison records show he was never discharged. Permission to publish a new edition of the Constitutions with the imprimatur of Grand Lodge presented Anderson and his publishers with the opportunity to bring out a new and vastly larger work to their mutual profit. It's important to note that here, as in 1723, Anderson was paid by the page, a common practice known as copy money, and it was his publishers who owned the copyright. 
To return to the first charge in 1738, Anderson writes this, which I'm not going to read word for word for, because I don't have enough time. Um, but it's a much more complex charge than the first charge that appears in the 1723 constitutions. And to understand what he means by things like the three great articles of Noah and the, the true Noahides and uh, the religion in which men, all men agree, we, we need to turn to Anderson's theological writings, especially his 1733, Unity in Trinity and Trinity in Unity, to determine what he means by key terms. This work is critical to understanding Anderson's theology. Not only is it a continuation of his stance at the Salters Hall debate, but the timing and description reveal it as the work upon whose merit he acquired a Doctor of Divinity degree from Marshall in 1733. Anderson terms unity and trinity a dissertation or an argument. While doctorates in divinity were not often awarded by Scottish universities uh, in the early modern period because they savor of popery, uh, attitudes began to change by the 18th century with some doctorates awarded on the basis of presentation of a thesis on a commonplace of theology. Anderson's, uh, P.J. Anderson's publications of the Marshall Records lists a, a doctorate of divinity awarded as a gift to a divine in England in 1733 on receipt of a diploma fee of 20 pounds sterling. This has long been identified as James Anderson's degree acquired to support publication of the royal genealogies. But its association with unity and trinity better fits Marshall's theological agenda and underscores Anderson's continued orthodoxy. This broadening of our research beyond Masonic historiography for evidence is crucial because Anderson did not choose his terminology with solely or even primarily a Masonic context in mind. Of particular interest in the first charge is Anderson's introduction of the Nodokai, pronounced in all sorts of different ways. You choose the one you like, and I will too. And the three great articles of Noah. Neither term appears in the 1723 constitutions, though Anderson features them prominently in Unity and Trinity. Indeed, an examination of this work does much to clarify his position in the theological landscape of the early 18th century. Anderson uses this text to press the strongly orthodox position he took in the Salters Hall debate controversy, namely that nonconformist clergy of the three main denominations, Presbyterians, Independents, and Congregationalists, should be vocal in their belief in the Trinity as defined by scripture, which Anderson describes as a trinity of persons and a unity of essence. Anything less or other is not orthodox and in Anderson's view, not Christian. Thus, in Unity and Trinity, he systematically demonstrates why modern Jews, Arians, Socinians, and other adversaries that affect no name are not orthodox, and more to the point, do not adhere to that religion in which all men agree. Further, he specifically denounces Unitarians, polytheists, Manichaeans, Catholics, voluptuous persons of all parties, which includes those libertines he mentions in the constitutions, as well as, and he's specific about this, philosophers and mathematicians who rely on reason and science to discover the nature of God. About these last two, Anderson's asserts, we have reason to thank God for this discovery of himself in his written word, when it could not be known by the light of nature, nor by all the rational inquiries of the learned. If all of these seekers fall short of that religion in which all men agree, then who gains Anderson's approbation? Those who follow the three great articles of Noah, the true Nodokai. But in this, Anderson seems to be a theological innovator. If he writes the constitutions in part to give greater specificity to Freemasonry, with unity and trinity, he attempts to accomplish the same for Christian orthodoxy. A survey of the theological works Anderson held in his personal library demonstrates his passionate adherence to Calvinism and his involvement in the controversies raging between theologians of various Protestant denominations. Of the approximately 1,200 works described in the book sale catalog after his death, um, nearly 400 are about the history of religious controversies with an emphasis on the Protestant Reformation and subsequent emergence of new denominations. 
Nowhere in these is there a clear definition of the three great articles of Noah. Instead, the seven laws, or the seven precepts of Noah, or of the sons of Noah, are discussed. Adherence to these seven laws is often referred to as the religion of the patriarchs. Jeremy Taylor, a contemporary Church of England cleric, writes that they consist of six laws given to Adam after his fall, with an additional seventh given to Noah. The six are as we might expect. Do not worship idols. Do not blaspheme against God, murder, fornicate. Do not steal or violate contracts. These are accompanied by an injunction to set up judges and magistrates to adjudicate disputes and distribute justice. The seventh precept, revealed especially to Noah, was do not eat the blood or the flesh with the life thereof. This prohibition against eating living flesh hardly seems likely as one of the three great pillars of universal religion, even if it is subsequently interpreted as an injunction to behave humanely. Perhaps more to our concern, Anderson's contemporaries identify the seven laws of the sons of Noah with natural law, which Anderson rejects as an insufficient basis for faith. What Anderson describes instead, so what does Anderson mean, either in Unity and Trinity or similarly in the 1738 Constitutions, when he refers to Noah and his three great articles? What Anderson describes is the original universal religion of mankind, revealed to Adam and taught to the patriarchs down to Noah. Um, before it was corrupted over the generations until the coming of Christ. It is the religion in which all men agree because it was indeed the religion of all men before they went astray. And importantly, it's still accessible to all. Of what does it consist? In Unity and Trinity, we find the three profound laws that Anderson identifies as the religion of the patriarchs. Belief in the Trinity. The necessity of divine revelation is contained in scripture and acceptance of eternal life after death. Anderson tells us, I shall give evidence of this truth, that God, Jehovah, is one from the testimony and reason. The testimony is good and strong, for it is attested. Who attests to it? All nations of Jews, Christians, and Mohammedans, both ancient and modern, who all agree in this truth. Interesting, Anderson even suggests that Kabbalistic Jews still maintained their original understanding of the Trinity based on patriarchal revelation. Anderson acknowledges that though hints of this truth can be found by reason in nature, the fullness of the Trinity is, quote, not discoverable by our reasons till it is assisted by revelation. For though we are not against reasons and similitudes in explaining it, yet we still must regard it as a mystery or secret truth. His rejection of the sufficiency of reason is unqualified. We ought th thankfully to acquiesce in the revelation and should not set up our vain philosophy, nor demand a mathematical demonstration of a thing above our most um, accurate mathematics. Unless we be deceived about God's intent, Anderson argues that the patriarchs knew this revelation from the traditions of their fathers, who had it from God himself, and this became the basis of scripture, which is necessary, sufficient, and self-explanatory. The third great article is belief in eternal life, and at eternal life after earthly death. Here Anderson presents a complex theology. A Calvinist, he praises God for his free, undeserved love in electing us before the foundation of the world in sending his Christ to redeem us. However, Anderson also holds out a slim hope of overcoming non-election, arguing, quote, they that are adopted into this heavenly father's family have all reason to rejoice and be thankful, as they that are not should labor for this adoption with the most vigorous endeavors, for greater the prerogatives and advantages of this filiation. Further, he argues that ultimately the salvation of any individual is a secret thing, which belongs to God, leaving the door to heaven open, potentially to Jews and Muslims, who are clearly monotheists, but probably not to Catholics or Unitarians, whom Anderson identifies as polytheists of one sort or another. Is that you? Am I done? Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs>